Hello and welcome to Failure and Analysis. My name is Kevin Jordan and today we have a hopefully a special treat. Uh, I'm doing a clubhouse call with three other devs um, and that will start in just a minute. It's uh, the three devs are Chris Kalecki, uh, Candace Thomas and another dev I've never had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, his name is Luca. Uh, I can't remember his last name but anyway uh, we'll be joining Clubhouse chat, and we'll be just talking about games and stuff. And I hope you enjoy it. So uh, let me um, let me actually fire up the call, and we'll get started. It's going to be super scuffed. It should be super fun. Hello. Hello there. Hey Kevin, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Sorry to interrupt you. No, it's totally fine. I am streaming, Not by yet. the way. Oh, great. So you figured out a way to stream the chat on your stream? Well, it's really scuffed. I'm just listening through the microphone on one of my phone, so... Oh, no, it's totally fine. It's going to be... Cool. Yeah. Oh, nice. It's true. It's true. I uh, I don't know how my chalk bucks are doing these days, but I was <laughs> stacking them high nice. for a while. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I haven't had a good way to spend those yet, but we had some good predictions going in Battle Brothers. But other than that, there was some gambling going on, but it felt dirty a little bit. <laughs> and Candace, nice to uh, talk to you finally. I, I think there was some overlap in our time at Blizzard, but I don't ever remember talking to you or... Even really yeah, meeting there, you, so it's nice to finally meet was. you. I actually had like a bit prepared that I wanted, like when we introduced ourselves. Oh, um, nice. Because I was like, man, Kevin Jordan, he's a legend. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean back then, or do you mean now? <laughs> yes, just yes. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, glad to hear it. Good answer. All right. I assume my, my status wasn't known until after I started streaming because that was by design back in the days. Nobody knew who anyone was behind the scenes. Bill Roper was making everything, every decision, you know, Blizzard <laughs> for the longest time. I feel like as just a fan as I was at the time, was it really like Ghost Crawler? Was it Greg that broke the mold with all that? That was yeah. when I first started being aware of individual devs. That's right, that's right. Um, yeah, Ghost Crawler definitely spent... How much time did he spend, Chris, doing like community work, um, which was very valuable, and he was very good at it. Um, oh, yeah, a lot. I mean, he was always kind of monitoring the forums and hearing how right. things were being receptive. Twitter, I think, you know, Twitter was like so new. Yeah, yeah. Know? He was like one of the first like developers I knew on it. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then you know, on my stream, I talk a lot about how, you know players don't really want that you know like they want to talk to the devs but at the end of the day they want their devs just spending 100 percent of their time on making awesome games right so every minute they spend not doing that and interacting with them you know like it takes away from awesome games being made so it's a weird uh it's a complex issue to try to solve in today's like more modern environment i agree i i also think that there is this this desire for the community to understand how the sausage is made mm -hmm. like how you know what is it like to be in game development how does a how does an idea go through the pipeline for this mm -hmm. for this game that i love but then beyond that kind of like peek behind the curtain i think that i think that you're right it's mostly just give me the updates and tell me good news that i want to hear about the games that i love and right. then please also i don't care about pictures of your cat <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well the good players do they care. So what's the topic today? I think uh, uh, Valheim? Or are we going to wait mm -hmm. until... You want to wait till 6, okay. This is just the pre... Yeah, just wait like a couple more minutes. Okay. And then we'll start, yeah. Sounds good. So, Luca, um, what... 
tell me about yourself? Like, um, what brings me here? Uh, I've heard a little, I'm a good but friend yeah. of Chris's. Oh, yeah. you have? Okay. Well, uh, I did work at Blizzard for a period of time. Um, I was there just about a little over a year, like 2017, 2018. I was on Heroes of the Storm. Uh, I'm an audio designer, and before that, I was living in Seattle and uh, just kind of making the rounds, contracting at a bunch of different companies. I was at PopCap, I was at Microsoft, I was at uh, Bungie for a little while on Destiny 2 stuff. And uh, but I've been, you know, a lifelong Blizzard fan, right? Um, completely obsessive with with Warcraft specifically, and so it was kind of only a matter of time till my path brought me there. But um, I met Chris. I don't even think I really met Chris until I was basically done with Blizzard. Okay. Uh, but, um, so we never even got lunch, you know, on campus or anything like that. But, um, yeah, I met him through Brian and, uh, and the fitness group, sort of. And then we started PvPing together in Battle for Azeroth. And, like, now Chris has just been, like, a real solid kind of uh, mainstay for trying to unpack the world as we're at home all the time, just peering out during the pandemic and right, feel like right. we're just on Discord shooting the breeze like a couple nights a week. I like it. But yeah, um, yeah. now I'm up in um, Vancouver working at a place called Clay Entertainment. Cool. Um, but yeah, you know, Chris and that crew has been kind of a life raft, so we're just talking games all the time. Right. That's okay, so just for everyone who's listening... Um, the path to greatness is first you join the fitness group and then you start PVPing. Yes. <laughs> and then from there you get ahead. Yeah, me and Kenneth were also in the fitness group too. So. Nice, nice. Okay, so yeah. Times, yeah. That was my problem. I never joined the fitness group, so <laughs> <laughs> life went straight down the toilet. <laughs> yeah, I feel obligated to inform you all that I can deadlift my own body weight. So nice. Really important. Like even now, even after this year at home, that's pretty good. <laughs> Probably, probably not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I wheeze picking up my cats at this point. Well, we are now at 6 o'clock. Do you want to wanna start us off, Chris? Yeah, yeah. So this is fun. I, I've been thinking about doing this sort of thing for a while now because I've been on Clubhouse just checking out different rooms and figuring out the format. And I think this is kind of a cool format to eventually, you know, I think have chat about actual gameplay of games. I think there's a lot of chats in here about like biz dev and like revenue and all this other kind of stuff, right? But there's not a lot of kind of talking about gameplay of games and the player experience. And so I thought it'd be fun to kind of start this thing up and then we just kind of chat with devs about gameplay and design and things of that nature. And then it'd be cool to bring up other people in the audience to like uh, involve them, ideally like players too, right? And get their thoughts and you know, I always like BlizzCon and the format of BlizzCon because you can sort of, you know, engage the player base. I think that's like one of the, the, the best parts about it. And mm-hmm. so I think this is a promising platform for the opportunity to do that. So um, I'll just kind of, let's just maybe go around and introduce ourselves because we have some people here, but we also have, you know, Kevin Stream as well. So right. um, my name is uh, Chris Clakey, game designer of 13 years working at Blizzard on like classes and PvP and systems and all those sort of things. Um, I actually have worked kind of with all this entire panel in some way. Uh, but I, when I first started, I was actually working with Kevin. Kevin. Kevin was kind of my mentor on a team and kind of showed me how to like, you know, how to actually, you know, really kind of build spells and, and work on gameplay and learn how to use WoW at it and all that. So it's really fun to, to bring Kevin in here and, um, yeah, that's me, and uh, maybe Candace, you can go. Hi, I'm uh, Candace Thomas. I also worked uh, on World of Warcraft with Chris, and yes, there was some overlap with Kevin Jordan, and I promised I would tell the story. So uh, <laughs> to me, Kevin Jordan was this legend. Uh, when I joined the team, everyone said that he was the vision holder for class design for World of Warcraft, and uh, as part of, as one does whenever you are a the 24-year-old, woman breaking into the game industry, um, you're terrified that people are going to find out that you are an imposter, that you are a fraud. And so I thought that the, the, the smartest thing was to never open my mouth to you. <laughs> Even though now you know, that's like the most ridiculous thing. Um, I just, I thought that I would keep my head down, I would do my work, I would work really hard, and then eventually you 
know, I would I would be good at making games. Um, right. So yeah, I just wanted to. I actually just wanted to say like thanks for for coming, and I I I really respect and admire you, and I'm really I, I really regret that I didn't use you as a resource whenever I was uh, like a, a, a blooming designer. Right. Um, right. But that, to finish that, so I started in games in about 2007, so I'm about 14 years in the industry now. Um, I made games like uh, World of Warcraft, Diablo 4. I went to Amazon Game Studio for like a hot second to work on their Lord of the Rings MMO. Um, but now I'm a principal game designer at Riot, uh, working on the new MMO. Exciting. So that's cool. And I'll pass that to uh, Luca. Cool, thanks, Candice. Uh, my name is Luca Fuzzi. I am an audio designer. I've been working in games for just about 10 years now. Um, I was working in the Seattle area for a number of years. I was at um, Microsoft. I worked at PopCap on a game called Plants vs. Zombies Heroes. I worked um, Contract on The Witness um, and one or two other titles for a group there. I was on Destiny 2 for a little bit, just hopping around. And then I met Chris um, when I was at Blizzard for a year, and here's the storm. Um, I know of Candice. I'm just meeting both her and Kevin really today. Uh, I am. I also think Kevin's a bit of a legend, so I'll just fall in line with that. And uh, as for as for my connection to this entire panel, um, you know, I, I, I hope to bring um, kind of like an audio designer's perspective on some of the things I've like, experienced in Valheim that, that pull me in, that feel good. I've gotten not quite as obsessed as this game as everyone else, but I'm not far behind. So, yeah, happy to be here. I'll throw it to Kevin. Wow, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm blushing. I can't even talk right now. You guys are too kind. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, my name's Kevin Jordan. I am one of the original three game designers for World of Warcraft. Um, it was my first game, and I've, I still just feel so fortunate to have had the opportunity to work on it. Um, I think it turned out really well. And um, I learned so much um, from some amazing people that were obviously all around me at Blizzard and on the team, etc. Um, from there, uh, in 2010, I left the company and went to work at another company called Cryptozoic Entertainment. Uh, where I worked on several board games and um, Hex uh, Shards of Fate, which was a digital uh, trading card game. And then after that, I went to Obsidian for a couple of years, where I worked on um, a couple of games, but mostly on Tyranny, which was a um, CRPG. Um, that was super fun to work on. Um, really proud of that one also. Um, but yeah, I've, I've only really worked with Chris I worked at the same time on the team as Candace. I'm sad that she never introduced herself. Um, I love talking to younger designers. And, um, yeah, it's a, a missed opportunity anyway. But, uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for the invite and uh, letting me join the panel. I really appreciate it. And I'm really excited about just chatting about games. Yeah, and, and if you don't mind me actually underlining something important that you, you said um this is like going to be a casual, you know, conversation between four almost strangers, um, and then I think eventually we'll invite, you know, you guys to come talk to us as well. But I wanted to um, underline: Kevin said that he made board games um, for for a while after leaving Blizzard, and some people think that that's not like game design cred. I, I've worked with a lot of contractors now who are trying to break into the video game industry, who have worked on board games before. And they say, oh, I don't know if my skills are transferable. And I say, are you kidding me? Like, uh, board games mm -hmm. are all about designing a simple and, uh, and like, understandable set of rules, right? And really, that's all video games are. It's like, there's the rules of combat, and here's the rules of our systems, and here's the rules of how you level up. And mm -hmm. so I, I just, like, to to also extend on how legendary Kevin Jordan is, that the fact that you, <laughs> you can make board games... Uh, successfully for that many years just goes to show like this is a person who is an expert in ludology and the study of rules and, um, <laughs> the, we're all like very blessed the very funny thing about um your comments there is that i had a pretty humbling moment when i went to cryptozoic because i went into a design meeting with a bunch of guys that were working on the wow tcg which was still under their care at the time and um 
I was coming, you know, coming off from WoW and I'd worked you know, in the industry for over a decade and I was feeling pretty good about my credentials, right? And I was in a room for five minutes with those guys uh, talking about card game design. And I realized I didn't know Jack Diddley about card game design. So it was a really humbling moment and it and also just led into an amazing learning experience. So they are different skill sets, but they're extremely transferable. And I've learned and grown so much having had the opportunity to work on a card game and board games as well as the digital game. So, um, yeah, for anyone out there who's developing those skills, they are absolutely transferable, as Candace said. Um, and they're really good at uh, rounding out um, your skill sets in terms of different types of experiences for different kinds of gamers. And uh, at the end of the day, it's, I mean, game design is just about creating an amazing experience. So uh, there's tons of different ways to do that on a wide variety of games. So um, don't think that it's a wasted effort. Totally. I, I do a lot of mentoring um, and, and speaking for young women in games. And often the first question they ask me is, what, what can I do? How can I sharpen my skill set for making video games? And I always say, make a board game, like make, mm -hmm. make something fun. I, I talk about chess. I say, you know, can you imagine what chess would be like without rules? Like wh what if you could just move the pieces and like, it's just a bunch of pieces on a board. It's not, it's not fun unless you have the rules. And so if mm -hmm. you can come up with like the mindset of making fun rules and fun gameplay like that, that's it. And you can do it with construction paper and drawing pretty figures. You know, you can, you can order a blank board game set on Amazon and make a, like a ridiculous like a scavenger hunt board game you can do whatever you want and, and so I always start with like even if you have no technical skills if you have a pen and paper you can still make a game anyway that got really deep sorry absolutely yeah 100% cool cool yeah so I, I one of the the main topic what I you know made this chat uh, after is I really want to talk to you guys about Valheim because this is a game that I've been playing a lot in the last like month or so since it really kind of blew up. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's so many like really cool design elements in the game. And I think the way that I wrote up, you know, a little blog post about this, about like, you know, I really feel like they focused on the player experience and you can really feel that in the game. Um, they have a lot of elements that are kind of similar to WoW and uh, to core RPGs and things like that. So I just kind of wanted to get your guys' take on, on the game generally um, who wants to start <laughs> who, who wants to who wants to start well um, I'll, I'll jump in what what's significant for me with Valheim is that it's the first of these type of games that I'm actually like really glued to uh, and I know you know I I still probably have like under under 100 hours but there have you know this genre is not super new I mean, Rust, I remember going and doing raids on random teenagers' huts and hideouts in, like, 2013. So it's been out for quite a while. But, like, for some reason, they just never really have a, a, a gravity to me. Like, because servers can get wiped so quickly and because they just explode into chaos. I, I, and and it's, I don't know. I've never, like, stuck on the treadmill of playing one of these. They always mm -hmm. just feel like I'll jam on it for a weekend and go... But there's just something about Valheim that's extremely pleasant to be in and feels continuous uh, and, like, worth investing in that, you know, it's tough to articulate, but it's the same sort of feeling you might have if you go and you start playing an MMO and you just have that sense. It's kind of like, you know, with anything, like the collective valuation of is this worth spending time in? And with some games, you just can tell, like, nah, it's, it's not really. You know, I don't feel like this is, quote, unquote, going anywhere. And Valheim does for me, which is funny because it's totally non-competitive mm -hmm. and you can play it totally single player. So, yeah, I, I, I would just like to hear you guys maybe unpack a bit of maybe why you think it, it has that effect. Like, what is it about this one that has kept you guys around? Or do you, do you all play the genre a whole bunch or? Yeah, I mean, I, I could unload if, if you guys want. Um, so for me, it's about... Um, it's less. It's kind of less about the the handcrafted experiences um, that many 
AAA games will provide for you. Like, there will be a, a cool, like, Michael Bay moment in a, in a video game where there's, like, the, you know, you're in the heat of combat, and it's been tuned just perfectly and just scripted, like, just exactly, and then you get the big, you know, explosion at the end, and then you're the hero, and th- those are all really cool moments. Um, but I think what's unique to, to Valheim, and, and I'll explain why it's, it's different than Rust to me also, is that every story is your story that you're telling. Um, and yes, of course, some of them will be will be expected. Like, an example is um, when I first started playing Valheim, I, I jumped onto a server of people that were super, super progressed, and so I knew nothing about the game. And they're like, just get on, get on the boat, just come with us, come on, take a sword, let's go! And I was like, hell yeah, like, sign me up, I'm a Viking. And um, we got on this boat, and we saw this island, and they said, "Oh, get your pickaxes out. We're gonna we're gonna get on this island. We're gonna get whatever this new ore is." And they ex- they explained to me that ore is very important in the game. And then as we're mining on, on this little island, the island comes to life and it sinks. And we're like, "What's going on? Like, what what just happened?" We're all like in the water. We have no stamina <laughs> left because we were just mining. We're drowning to death because like. We got on the back of what was essentially like a big turtle run. What just, what is this thing? Wait, and what? I mean, uh, I spoiler. guess this is a spoiler cast now? Yeah. Dude, yes. all right, all right, all right. Yes. Um, but, and it is amazing, that kind, of, that kind of stuff happens left and right. Like, we were out mining copper. It's always an ore-related story in this game. But, like, we're out mining copper, and all of a sudden something so, like, something larger than we had ever seen. It's a troll, by the way, with blue skin comes up, and it's like this huge forest troll, and it's like, the camera shakes and all of a sudden one of us is dead and we look over and we're like run from this thing and so we run to our little hut because we had made a we made our little our little sleeping hut that we and with a little chest and um then the troll came over and smashed the hut and killed all of us and that was just <laughs> so unexpected and it was so unscripted it was just one of those moments that you can't you can't buy that kind of exploration. So, so what I wanted to unpack was the difference between that and a game like Rust, or a game that like is a, a campaign based like um, narrative experience. Is that like yeah, one, it's your story, and that it's it's all about the exploration. It's like we were out doing this thing and we found this thing, and that's super cool. And then to delineate that from the Rust experience, where Rust is actually, it, I mean, it's a it's a survival crafting game like Valheim, but actually it's a completely different genre. Um, Rust is a battle royale. It's a it's an elimination game where you play until somebody kills you and robs you of all your stuff and then you have no intrinsic desire to play anymore, right? Whereas, like, this is a very different story. This was, we went out together and we explored and we did this thing and it was, and, and we found something. Whereas the Rust story is, we killed some people and we became top dog on the server. Um, and now I'll like, get off of my soapbox, but I think that Valheim has like the greatest player stories. The kind of stuff you want to tell your friends just happened to you in a video game. And it feels so authentic because it's your story and, and maybe mm-hmm. someone else didn't experience it that way. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, and it's actually really important. One of the things I, I talk about a lot is um, games that generate stories uh, and how important that is. Like, uh, and this goes way back to kind of the, when we were making WoW. Um, when I used to listen to the stories around the water cooler, you know, around the office, because um, tons of people were playing EverQuest. And a lot of the stories boiled down to we sat at a specific camp in a specific dungeon and we farmed it for five hours and then we got this piece of loot, right? And I was always really disappointed with that story right and it's a very common story um but i had come from ultima online where the player stories to me were much richer in that in that sense um because they involved interactions between players and unexpected events and all kinds of just you know basically chaos right or or things that were putting they're taking you in and and putting you in an, an uncomfortable place right outside your comfort zone. And that's what, what Valheim is very good at and what actually causes a lot of those stories to emerge is because you are outside your comfort zone. Um, when you're always playing a game within expected parameters, right? Like there's no sur- surprises, then it kind of plays out exactly how you expect it to. And it, and it also plays out the same for all kinds of different players. 
So there's nothing to share between the two of you. It's like, did you go and do the thing yet? Yeah, I did. You know, <laughs> and that's the end of the story. But in a game like Valheim, it's it's they did such a great job of um, making you feel uncomfortable. Um, like some great examples are, you know, the fatigue system. When you get cold and wet, it like it makes you sluggish. So you actually want to be you want to go home and sit in your home next to the hearth and warm up, right? It's a very subconscious thing, but they did an amazing job at making you hate being out in the world for too long because you get cold and wet and tired. Um, and that's when things get a little trickier because if you have to fight, you have less stamina available. And so it's you feel sluggish and it feels harder to, you know, kill the things on your way back than it was, you know, on your way there. Um and then on top of that, like, again, the player interaction, if you're playing multiplayer with everyone doing crazy things and having their own objectives, um, there's just constant opportunity for people to do crazy things, which are then stories that are created that you can share with your friends. Right. And if I think about like, why is why is Twitch successful? It's because people want to share these stories right and they get to do it live now on twitch right but back in the day we loved telling stories as well like we all each of us have these amazing stories from our lifetime of playing games that we probably repeat you know to people way too often right but um they're momentous occasions for us and so games that have consistently created stories that we take with us for the rest of our lives um, that's where it's at for me. And when it comes to game design, delivering a good experience and, uh, games that deliver an experience that we've all come to expect now, especially in PVE, which are about progression and the treadmill and things like you guys had already illustrated. Um, that's not enough. Like, I feel like we can do better and Valheim has done a great job at that. The execution of what is not a new thing in terms of like, the game model. Um, it's not like they've created a brand new genre here. It's just a game with some survival elements, some building and exploration and, and progression. But the way they've executed it is so masterful that uh, you it generates these stories and it creates these moments of discomfort and, you know, creates um, the basic concept, you know, or the basic playing out of um, the life experience, right? Which is struggle and success and loss and all those other things. So it's just been masterfully executed. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's funny when we talk about stories, it's always interesting, just really like stories are so core to the human experience as well. Like whenever we mm -hmm. think about like our lives or when we talk to other people about when we meet them, you know, we always think about ourselves or these things in a story, right? And, um, yeah, I think this is, like, so important in modern game design, especially when you talk about Twitch or all these things like that, or if the game goes viral, is that, you know, whenever I talk with anybody about Valheim, they always talk to me about a story of their experience in the game, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, like, you know, a lot of other games, you know, it's just very narrative driven. You go to A to B to C to D or whatever, and the designer is making, you know, encouraging you to go there. And um, I think really open-ended design where you just kind of give them the environment and just let them go, I think that's that's really what players are after these days. Yeah, yeah I, and it's I think timing was also on Valheim's side. Um, when you think about what you were saying about reflecting on the human experience and how we love to share stories and, you know, grow, grow upon and with each other with anecdotes and lessons learned and all that stuff, I also think about how it mimics kind of like um so you know in a in a triple a narrative driven game or an rpg there's this role that you take on and you decide i'm going to pick up the shield and i'm going to be the tank and i'm going to and i understand what that role is for myself hopefully um or i understand that i will take the role of a healer or maybe i will take the role of a damage dealer or whatever these games are very different these crafting games and, and this is something that was similar with rust as well these survival games i mean where your role isn't based on your weapon or your ability in combat. It's kind of where you are in society. Not society, but, like, for example, I am the kind of player in survival games that I love to build the base. I love to organize. I love to farm. Like, I love to show love to my friends by saying, 
hey, I got you a bunch of iron, and now you can make that sword. And that's the role that I take. And in Rust, it was very, it, I, I took that same role, but it was it was as a different support. Like, I, I didn't like to go raid other people's bases because I felt like it was harmful and mean to do that. But I did like to make sure everybody had the stuff that they wanted. Um, and and, what, and the reason I think that timing is really key right now is because people don't have their tribe in real life, you know, with the pandemic. Yeah, and totally. so right, right. now they can have this group of people that likely they, they're already friends with. You're, you're probably playing Valheim with your, your, your small group of friends because there's, you know, a max of 10 on a server. Um, so just but, to clarify, um, you prefer being the arms dealer to the guy actually committing the atrocities? Is that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah, I will, okay. Yeah, I will supply, One step you know, distant with, from the actual yeah, carnage. Like, okay. I just mine the iron, you know, I don't want to know what right. you're doing with it. Okay. So take the C4. I'm not going to ask any questions. Right. I know you're going to come back in a bunch of days. <laughs> Fair and enough. I'm not going to, I'm just going to look the other way. <laughs> but yeah, so I was just going to say, like, it's just really, it's an important game right now because it's about making a, a, a tribe and it's about making friends and it's about coordinating all of your efforts. And I feel like people are starved for that right now. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's also... time this year's Animal Crossing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think you know, they're also the just too, starved yeah. by um, good PV games, right? Like, um, like you were saying before, like so many of them are on that path, you know, that where they end up feel they end up feeling like um, I've watched a television show at the end of it, you know, like, and the story you can share with your friends is I've watched the end of the series, you know, I watched episodes one through ten and it was over and I enjoyed it, but uh, you don't outside of that you don't get to share any unique stories, but. What Chris was saying was like, yeah, we start talking about Valheim and the first thing that comes to everyone's mind is a specific, unique story to them that changes, you know, from person to person. And uh, that's why it's um, so captivating. I'm actually yeah. super curious to hear what, what Luca thinks about the sound design of Valheim because I picked up on, on some little things, but I am very untrained. Is there anything that struck you about about some like clever tips or tricks that they did that, that made something feel more immersive or contributed to that player story? The ear sounds. <laughs> yeah, dude. Was, I mean, so right off the bat, we should say, <laughs> I have never heard a deer make a sound at all in real life. And the deer in this game, it's like, someone must have found some just, you know, just over and over again, yeah, man. Really it's like... Someone must have found one or two deer sounds that they loved, and uh, and they let the the probability play chance at a hundred percent to just mm-hmm. show them off. And <laughs> to be honest, I, actually, that's like kind of one of my gripes with it because when you're first starting out, they're the only things really that you hear. And it, you, typically, you want to use audio to you know try to call your attention to something. And if you're like a naked Viking out in the woods and you don't know what to do and it's getting dark, any sound you hear is going to be kind of you know, warned, weird about, you're going to be trying to find out what's up. Once I realized it was the deer, I was like, <laughs> these aren't even threatening me. It was a little disappointing, you know? <laughs> so, um, that is my, my main gripe, but overall, um, the sound design in Valheim is, it's what, I mean, it's what it needs to be. This isn't really like First off, the game's in early access, so any roughness that's there is to be expected. Like, that's what the polished phase is about. I know how it is. You just try to get something in to just validate this system's working. You know, goblins are making sounds when I hit them. You know, they're, they're propping it all up right now. But um, it, it, it's not really a canvas for doing extremely imaginative, crazy sounds. I find it's a very gritty feeling, real sort of game. That kind of PS1 foxily nature sort of lends itself to that, too. Um, so the sound that's there does a really good job of just pulling you into the world in this kind of elemental way. I mean, it's a lot of ambiences. There's a lot of quiet. Um, and, you know, going into buildings and standing next to fires while it's raining outside, I think the storm audio is actually mm-hmm. really killer. Yeah, the howling but, wind yeah. and the, and it, the it, rain great, sound amazing. A, a lot of the sound design in this game uh, gets to sing because it's not a very crowded mix. Like, there's just not a lot going on, which mm-hmm. to be completely honest is how real nature is um everyday life is you know noisy chaos all the time if you're standing out in the middle of some you know norse forest you're gonna hear some wildlife but Mm -hmm. you know the smallest thing's gonna break the silence so i I like the quiet there because everything you you do just gets like center stage very easily you don't have to do any crazy kind of 
mix tips with, oh, let me pull down the sound of eight other people with guns so that I can hear my special, you know, charging up. It's like very, it's very austere. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it works. Yeah. Um, like I said, my, my whole, the reason I've glued to Valheim, uh, besides the stories and everything else, is like it's just, it's just a, a, a world that feels good to be in. You know, whatever you're doing, you just want to hang out there, which is, uh, that counts for so much. And yeah. it's not something you would necessarily think to design for, I think, in a game like this, but it, it makes everything easier, you know? It's, it, it floats the rest of the boats. Yeah, I'd yeah, like to... Uh... you know... Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Um, just to, um, I'd like to point out a really important thing about Valheim is that, like you were saying, like early access element, like Valheim is is average to below average in a number of important areas, right? Like the character yeah. models don't look great. The animations are real sloppy in some places, you know, like um, they do hit it out of the park on, on some of the atmospheric stuff for sure. Um, but to me, all of that points to how good the design is because it's been so yeah. popular despite some of these failings, despite some of this average kind of kind of stuff. Um, and and when you talk about like the design execution of like that was a conscious choice to do some of the sounds and make it like you were saying kind of quiet a lot of times, uh, deer notwithstanding. Um, it, it all very again just masterful execution and like the decision making of what is the purpose of this and what is the purpose of that there's very little waste in Valheim like everything that's in the game is there for kind of a specific designed purpose and that's why I love how how it's been um, executed yeah here's oh, oh I was just gonna say to me the difference between minimalism and just not owning any shit is when it feels very intentional mm -hmm. and like this game i think can pull off a lot of minimalist elements because what's there is incredibly satisfying yeah. so you know it's allowed to feel a bit bare in spots it's intentional mm -hmm. i was gonna say that the negative space element that you talked about is really interesting because i hadn't even considered that i i remember back to my player story when i got to a point where i needed a lot of deer hide and I hadn't noticed that that noise was even the deer. I honestly thought it was just like an ambient track of something. Cause I, cause also I didn't know what deer sound like. Um, mm -hmm. But then I realized like, oh, this, yeah, it's intentional. Like Kevin was saying, it, this happens for a reason. And the reason is that the deer have a, a large like awareness radius of the player. And if you walk within that awareness radius, they run away, right? Mm -hmm. And so that incentivizes you to crouch down and stealth and get your bow out. You That's know? Right. And you get to feel like a real like a real huntsman in the forest, right? But yeah, hunting deer is a very satisfying experience because of the way they've put built it up. Totally. And they only yes, live in, the, in amongst the trees. They, they, they live where it's safe, like like real deer would. But, and the problem is that you can't, and it's problem solving like Luca was talking about. Like, it's all very minimal. This The reason that they bark is because you need to know when you're around deer because likely by the time you see them, you'll have already scared them away. And so when I when I learned that I can listen for those barks and that it's directional and I can know which way the deer was, I felt like I'm the master hunter now, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm the hero. And I felt that, that was really interesting because yep. to contrast that in a game like Rust, which was its like soul sister predecessor is like the PvP version of that game. Sound design is used very differently and very also intentionally. Um, sound design in Rust is you're always listening out in case there's a player nearby because you're terrified that they're going to kill you and rob you, right? So, <laughs> oh my god, the sound of footsteps in Rust is just... <laughs> terrifying, right? And, and whenever you whenever you go out to uh, mine, tr mine ore or cut down trees, you have to be wary of the noise that you're making because you're, you're essentially like... You're emitting a mating call, except it's for violence, right? So <laughs> you're, you're constantly aware of the noises you're making. And so... Uh, even though the game like, seems similar, it's, it's just funny how that relationship with sound has completely changed when you go from a game like PvP Rust to PvP Valheim. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in, what was interesting, there was an interview with the developers, uh, I think Iron Games, they're called the developers of Valheim, and they asked them, you know, uh, did you play a lot of survival games as reference for this game? And they actually said, no, not really. Uh, they base a lot of their design decisions off games that, like Breath of the Wild 
and, and wow mm-hmm. and things like that. And I thought that was really interesting because you guys were talking about like negative space, and that is something I thought Breath of the Wild does very well, right? Not crowding out the world with overcrowded with creatures or, or mm-hmm. NPCs or whatever. And um, yeah, Valheim does a really good job with that. It makes it more immersive. It makes encourages you to just you know navigate around looking for raspberries or whatever it is. And um, yeah, I think that's another really great aspect of the game. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention as to why I think it's it, what what I think gives games a good reputation, and this is kind of aside to the the genre or the kind of the the meta of the game. Um, I think that when when players quit playing your game, that's a moment that's really important um, because if they quit because they're full and they're happy. That's that's a you need to play this game like I it, like I didn't finish it I never killed Ganon because blah 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 but um, whenever if people quit because they're frustrated which often like when people quit Rust maybe they'll quit Rust because they're frustrated or if they quit a game that um, you know they never got the loot drop that they wanted or they couldn't beat the boss at the end like me and Sekiro um, when you leave a game full and happy and you could kind of push away from the table saying you know I've had enough and I, I really enjoyed this as opposed to like I have to rage this game or this game left me unsatisfied in some kind of way I think that's really important and so that's important to like the player story and to making people want to play with you is like you can play this game you can eat at this this game buffet for as long as you want and you know what when you're done that's okay like you can walk away and I can still play the game mm-hmm. which is also like really 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 important for a, a cooperative experience yeah and it puts you in a frame of mind where you're excited for the next bit of content they're going to make too so you can return happily um that was always a a big thing for a lot of mmos um for people that had played too much like they could never leave normally you know like they had to delete all their items and destroy their characters you know and it's just like they had to set fire to everything so that there was no chance they'd come back um and they ended up coming back anyway right but um it's such a contrast to like yeah i played that game and i loved it and i'm really excited for the next bit you know like i think a lot of games and developers uh, and companies have lost track of um you know that goal is to make sure when people are done they leave happy you know like they're trying to keep you uh, fixated on your game well beyond their exhaustion point through, you know, gambling mechanics or addiction mechanics or whatever it is. And it feels less honest, you know, like Valheim feels really honest in its design and the, you know, their business approach, right. To making a game. And that's why it feels like such a work of art because you, you can, you can believe that what they're trying to do is give you an honest experience and a fun experience. You don't feel like, you know, they're going to nickel and dime you. So such a different um, approach, you know, that's re- super refreshing. Yeah, I mean, I think the other dynamic of the game, too, is, I mean, one a really funny story that I saw, one of the funniest ones is, you know, as you know, you can, you can kind of tame the boars, right, and breed mm-hmm. them, etc. But you can also tame the wolves. And people tame the wolves, and then the wolves kind of uh, got loose and started going <laughs> around the world breeding. And then the entire overworld was filled with wolves that were allied with the, you know, the players. And, and, and uh, I thought that was really interesting because that was always kind of the, the original sort of aspects like that were kind of the original vision of like, you know, Ultima and things like that where mm-hmm. basically uh, creatures would breed and it would have an effect yeah. on the overworld. Yeah, the ecology um, that they tried to bake in. Is, yeah, is that why yeah. that patch note said that they had reduced the rate that wolves breed? Because that makes total sense. <laughs> Could be. Like, Procreation yeah, rate minus five percent or something, which I thought was oddly specific and no one asked for. <laughs> I I remember reading the patch notes that I don't remember that one, but I remember that you know deer sound frequency was in, increased, so the whole list was kind of <laughs> you know trolly. But I can't remember if that's the or I don't know if that's the list you read or a different one. But. Can you imagine the player story though? Like you're breeding a bunch of wolves, and you're like the wolf breeder for, mm-hmm. the, for your friends. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the world is taken over by wolves, and suddenly <laughs> someone comes on a Discord and they go, "Who oh, let the dogs out?" <laughs> right. Sorry, oh that was gosh. a very long joke. Who let the dogs out? And I had to make it. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, we're half we're 
past the half, half hour. And Did I, I just kill the whole conversation? <laughs> <laughs> you, you just triggered anyway. Chris's segue. Yeah. That's right. We are all checking our watch after that. <laughs> but I, yeah, and that wordplay means. <laughs> I didn't want to give the opportunity to bring the people up who'd like to chat. You know, we're in our humble beginnings here. This is our first uh, episode. But we do have Kevin's uh, listeners on his stream as well, which is some of my favorite audience because they're so, like, really, really knowledgeable about games and MMOs and virtual worlds and stuff. So um, I see, you know, Rachel's here. Rachel is a friend of ours, used to work at Blizzard, works at Bonfire or some other Blizzard developers are Rachel if you're interested we can bring you up as well um, I, I kind of uh, left open the raised hand so if anyone's interested to add to the discussion or bring up uh, uh, their point of view go ahead and raise your hand we'll, we'll bring you up um, but yes uh, I didn't want to like segue you there Candice but uh, <laughs> you know uh, put your hand up also if you want Candace to never make that joke ever again. Oh, there you go. It's, I'm no longer welcome on the podcast. I brought you up, Rachel. Hello. Hi. My hand was totally not up to, to not have Candace jokes. I love Candace jokes. <laughs> They're amazing. How are you doing, Rachel? I'm doing fantastic. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about how the fact that the quality of the art just does not matter even a little bit. Right. That's interesting. As Absolutely. The in the room. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that was one of the things that surprised me when I hopped on to Valheim and I was like, wow, everything is ugly. This is so gross. I'm only going to last like five minutes. Mm-hmm. And like 10 minutes later, it didn't even matter. You're hooked, yeah. Again, the game design oh, like saves it, right? Um, but there, I, I will say that there are a lot of, I think, like beautiful vistas and the environment yeah. effects. And so there, there is really amazing art in places. But yeah, like what we've expected come to expect from character models and animations, I think is, is below average. Yeah, it's really shocking the amount of beauty that you get out of, like, just the atmospherics and the mm-hmm. water shader and, like, it's, it's the environment. It's not the characters. It's not the VFX. Yep. It's not even, like, the ground textures or the, the building material textures. Like, all of that is mm-hmm. subpar. But I think it's subpar for a reason because this is one of the quickest downloads I've ever had. Right. So I was like, hey, I tried this with yeah, And yeah. I was like, oh, 10 minutes later, even less, here I am. Right. And the question you end up asking yourself is, well, is it better than Minecraft? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's an important inspiration and kind of like a very important yeah. art to set for the art expectation. So, yeah. I, I'm curious, though, um, did, did anyone else notice? Because I feel like I've done a lot of development in, in Unity and in uh, Unreal lately. And I feel like if you look at the free stuff or if you look at the stuff you can buy from the marketplace, I notice that shake language everywhere. It's like whenever you, like for Luca, like sound design, remember like the first time you heard the Wilhelm scream and now it's <laughs> everywhere because you know it's part of like a free package of sounds? Mm-hmm. Sure. There are some so, sounds you just don't touch. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I find myself doing things like uh, looking for the shape language of assets I recognize from the marketplace and then seeing, like, who retextured this? How did they do this? Because it's still very impressive that a a team of, what, just four people made this game. Um, But I actually wanted to ask you, Rachel, um, did you ever get to the point where you um, you had either a stag breaker or a sledge hammer, an iron sledge? Yeah. Okay, that... That VFX actually impressed me. <clears throat> like, given the rest of the game, the fidelity of the rest of the game. Sorry. And I was like, man, that looks like something that, like, a, the, somebody would have created. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally. It, it feels like most of it is just, um, like, you can see the square texture. Like, square textures are a big no-no in VFX. And you can see them everywhere. But you're totally right. That sledge, the big, like... I'm hitting goose now. Sledge is like, wow, that's incredible. It looks actually looks nice. It's kind of weird to see the contrast. I'm wondering if, because they're so early access and it's such a small team, if they're going to be leveling up the art or if that's like not even on their radar and they're like, this mm-hmm. art is just fine. Yeah, it should be really interesting to see how they proceed from here because they definitely have the resources now to, to see out their vision. So if they were held back because of that, that's, you know, a whole new ballgame. Yeah, the- question, do you guys think it would be worth it? Do you think they should put their effort into a new game? Like, is it worth it to remaster that game? Would they actually get a good ROI? Would people rebuy the game, or would it be more popular than it is right now? It's a fascinating thought. Uh, it's I don't more think about I remaster the game, but I think 
you know, they could invest a little more on new biomes, perhaps, or adding different assets. You know, I think it's there's still a lot they could add to the game, and they have a whole roadmap of things they want to add. Right. And so, yeah. For me, it's just about them seeing out their vision. Like, does it bother them that that it looks the way it does? If it doesn't, then proceed. You know, double down. But if it it it's one of those things that they're just living with because they didn't have the resources, then yeah, by all means, use the resources to chase the dream you actually wanted to put together in the first place. But I think they've um, yeah, I mean, they've established a lot of trust with us, right? Like, you know, what they've created so far, like we're excited to see what they do next. So there's a lot of trust between us and them, and and we should uh, let them, you know, we should let them run with it. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, Steps, how you doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good, good. Nice to meet everybody. Uh, what's up, Kevin? How's it, how's it been hanging, man? Real good. Happy uh, fatherhood to you again. Belated, of course, but... Appreciate it, appreciate it. Um, my name is Tips. I, uh, I work on the offside side for a gaming org called OTK. We recently hosted a Valheim tournament about a week or so ago, and uh, we were really happy with the results. A lot of the guys have been playing the game, enjoying it. Um, but you guys brought up some really cool points today. I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, specifically with regards to like zone design, sound design, and narrative. And like it kind of all rolls together, I feel, that, that sense of minimalism and uh, mm-hmm. how there really is no narrative driver throughout the game. And yeah. that's something I noticed uh, that really hooked me. It reminds me a lot of like Dark Souls, for example, yep. where you have this, there's something going on kind of subsurface. And there are things, and if you pick up certain items, you can read the text, and you know you can connect all the different items together to kind of tell a narrative. But it's not really in your face. Yeah. And um, I'm curious how you guys think that approach applies, whether it be the minimalism in the storytelling, the minimalism in the sound design, environment design. How does that apply to like uh, to MMOs? Who I, I think we've seen like a lot of over design MMOs nowadays. So I'm curious uh, to hear your guys' thoughts on. Could that same design logic be applied to like more massive games where there's so much else going on? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll yeah. T- I'll take it. Um, Go for it. Uh, absolutely, I think some of the, the the people's fondest you know memories of good games come from that sense of like being shown, not told, what the story is. Right, like Fallout has traditionally used this to great effect. Dark Souls, as you mentioned. Um, you know, original World of Warcraft as well. Like, there's a whole story going on within Blackrock Depths, which is one of the greatest dungeons of all time, right? And, you know, some of it is quest driven, but a lot of it is just this is a living place. And if you pay attention, you can parse out what's going on here and how these people live or how these creatures live and everything else going on. So I think it's particularly important for games like an MMO because uh, the players are supposed to be involved in that sense of discovery um, and ex- exploration and, you know, sharing their opinions, essentially collaborating, you know, socially to work out what are the mysteries here, where are the secrets, um, and not just be kind of hand-told everything that, you know, by the hand, you know, like they... Um, more modern MMOs do. Uh, so I think it's actually really important and far more appropriate in, in MMOs because of all of the other things that MMOs are trying to do. But it's been consistently used in a lot of single player games as well to really good effect. And Valheim is no different. I love it. I, I think also that it, it just depends on what you're going for in your game. And as long as you keep it consistent, I think that's what, I kind of think that's the beauty of like pretty much every Every AAA Japanese game I've played is a very, it's either a complex, deep system or it's a simple premise and they never really stray over the lines. And what I mean by that is like, um, if you think of a spectrum of storytelling where there is the, um, I think we call it in, in games, we call it like the theme park where, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of zones and the, the, the analogy there is that every time you ride a roller coaster, it's going to be the same, right? And it's just taking people, you know, cart by cart through this scripted, you know, the Magic Castle, not Magic Castle, the, the Wild Frogs, Mr. Frog's Wild Ride or mm-hmm. whatever. It's, the narrative's never going to be different. You're, everyone's going to go through it, and you're just sort of going to wait your turn to do it. Um, 
and then there's like the opposite end of the spectrum is like a true open world sandbox game almost like dark souls where there's no there's no cinematics there's no the story that you get is whatever story you choose to absorb and that's okay um and as long as you never mix those two too much so example if if your world of warcraft player is 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 expecting to understand why the villain is a villain and you don't do a good job of of putting that in the player's face then they're going to walk away unsatisfied and and the opposite is, is true for a game like maybe maybe not dark souls but like a very true sandbox game where if suddenly you're in this this immersive Valheim experience and then there's just like a random cinematic that's three and a half minutes long. It's like, all right, let's explain this whole world. We're going to talk about the with Forsaken. We're going to talk about why the stag is a fucking ghost. <laughs> like, I think that's whenever you define the expectations of your, of your audience and then it becomes weird. So I, I don't think there's like a right or a wrong approach. I think it's just like staying true to the identity of your game. That's the most important. But yeah, I, I think the MMO hasn't explored like far enough away from the theme park, um, like version of, of narrative. So, no, it's a really good point. I like uh, I like the mix. I like yeah. I that that it definitely like I think a lot of examples where they they did in hindsight try to mix things up, whether it was intentional or due to lack of resources or whatever. Where there are points in World of Warcraft where something happens and you're just kind of like. Wait a minute! I didn't get I didn't get the full like why did this happen? What's there's like this big twist or something like that? And I, I feel like part of it is you know the game is so massive and it's played over such a long period of time. You're not just playing for you know two to twelve hours and the game's over. You're potentially playing over hundreds of hours, and uh, so the message gets lost. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I actually think that's a really cool point. I, I haven't heard that perspective before. I am. Um... I don't think there's anything that I could add over the top of uh, what Chris and Kevin might say, or like, you know, even Asmongold might say as to MMOs being sort of over-designed and the questions of respecting the player and leaving space for discovery there and not making things so explicit. Like, I, you know, I've, I've absorbed a ton of those debates and I think they're all great. But what this uh, Valheim is making me think of on the topic of minimalism and uh, and sound and, and, and just everything again actually is... Uh, this is where I'll get on my pedestal and talk about The Witness for a few minutes um, <laughs> because it is just like one of my favorite titles and I think where I kind of, another another spot where I turn the corner uh, about a developer really respecting the player. The Witness, if people don't know about it, it's made by Jonathan Blow who created the game Braid in 2008, which is the beginning of some big Xbox Live indie movement. This game came out like five years ago and uh, basically you just wake up, you're on an island, and the whole mechanic of the game is solving basically line tracing puzzles. And there's like not really any VO, um, you, there are no text boxes popping up telling you what's what. You just start walking and it has a very mist-like feel to it. It's a mm-hmm. puzzle game. But, um, you know, stepping into that world and, and how purposefully bare uh, everything has been left really just lets your brain start to fill in all the gaps of like well what this world must mean and yep. it feels kind of like um anybody ever you know maybe i'm dating myself but ever watched the tv series lost back when it ran you felt like the characters on this island that just had all these weird mysteries they were always throwing at you and if they didn't answer them it was maybe almost even better because it was like you just wondering what was out there in the dark sort of and the witness does this so well and the puzzles require you to be so attentive to the environment to figure them out like you might look for a tree branch that's bent in a certain way to know how to finish a puzzle that's shaped like a tree and once you realize that the game is everything is purposeful like you you just cultivate this like super intense attention you're walking around you just feel like you're you know neo looking at code like oh my god everything (laughs) is significant all of a sudden Mm -hmm. and um and the game is just not even really hand it's not handing you achievement sounds it's not handing you points. There are no coins or anything like that. It's like just wind. There aren't even any animals in the soundscape. This is really intentionally done because they don't want to suggest that there, there are people there if there aren't. There are oh. animals there if there aren't. Are there any sound you alerts walk- to tell you about a new sale any- in the store? <laughs> no. There's <laughs> nothing like that. It's, really? it's, That's it's like it, it, it forces you to really make your own rewards. And... Uh, Anyways, it's just an incredible title if you're into games that kind of like ask you to fill in the gaps and really, you know, um, respect your time, respect your intelligence, 
work on your imagination for you. Like I, I can't recommend it enough. And I just think it's like such a singular piece of, uh, of, of design too and following through with, you know, you'll, you'll sometimes hear designers talk about what well, we want to deliver X experience with this game. Man, I went and watched a, a talk of Jonathan Blow's from like five years earlier where he was speaking about getting the witness ready. And he was saying, oh, I want to make a game about the, the feeling of epiphany. And like he 100% delivered on it with this game. And nice. it's just like, it's a wild feat. But if you're into the Spartan vibes of Valheim, I would maybe give that one a spin. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I feel like oh, I should say cool. also that it's, I just learned today that it's going to be free on uh, from PlayStation uh, March 25th. So if Ooh. you can wait a couple days, you might be able to play it for free on uh, PlayStation. Very nice. And now, I'm not, hashtag not an ad. Hashtag I just learned this. I thought it was cool. Sorry. Sponsored <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I was not paid for that segment. It's true. Also, please pay me. <laughs> but I, I think Know, tips. I think a good, it, you know, it's a good observation to reference Dark Souls because as you as you mentioned, like in Dark Souls, it's really they have a core setting, a core kind of like world that you kind of feel through the world level design and immersion. But it's up to the player to kind of go and learn more, right? Mm-hmm. You have to actively go out to kind of go discover. And I think that is a really kind of good model to go because. Like Kevin said, it's like, you know, play, don't tell sort of thing. You don't want to just put the story right in the player's face and just have them talk to this NPC and that mm-hmm. NPC and listen to those VO, right? It's it's more uh, engaging for the player. Yeah, exactly. like, if you like, do that like, really early as well, you create an expectation in the player that I'm going to be spoon-fed the rest of the story. So they actually stop exploring. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I'll point to again is the, the classic, you know, the vanilla WoW cinematic. Uh, opening cinematic what is the story there it's like you don't know about any bad guys or anything else it's just you are going to be one of these people living in this huge amazing world that's it the story is yours go get it you know and that shifted over the time with cinematics to be like here's the big bad and this is the guy you're going to be fighting and saving the world right and so now players are on you know they're sitting back in their chairs and waiting for the story to come to them rather than going out and seeking it and making it themselves but also, to be fair, I just wanted to say, like, also, that we're, I'm, I'm, I feel like we shouldn't feel like we're, I feel like the audience shouldn't take away that we're shaming that kind of game, because those there's still a place for those games, and mm-hmm. they're still very satisfying games, especially if you look into the people who really flex into the narrative, things yeah. like the Telltale games, well, or, sorry. yeah, where you're like an active participant in the story, which is always really compelling, right? Even in classic WoW and modern WoW, you feel like you are an active participant in the story, even if the story is the same for you as it is for the other person next to you, um, there, there's still a, there's still a, it is still good design and it is still a good game if they are force feeding you the story. It just obviously has to be a good story. So. Yeah, if that's what they set out to do. Yeah, well said. If that's what they set out to do, then there's some amazing games out there that do just that. So yeah, like you were saying earlier, um, what's the identity of your game? What are you trying to achieve? There's high quality that can be achieved in either method. Absolutely. It worked. It worked for Cyberpunk. I mean, I think that that it, there was an expectation of that game feeling more sandboxy than it really is in practice. Like the AI mm-hmm. is kind of thin on the ground. It's like an ocean wide and a puddle deep. Mm-hmm. But I thought that the mainline narrative, the quality of all the voice acting, the yes. capture, the the lighting, the you know cinematography of it mm-hmm. was so good that like I just wanted to strap into the roller coaster and just do the entire <laughs> right. thing. Like right. I didn't need to really make up my own story because it was just freaking awesome yeah i agree uh chris i feel like your article kind of touches on some of this stuff about what what developers might do to kind of take some of the guardrails off the player experiences and and you know let let you know players figure things out for themselves a little bit more like i think there's a kernel in your article talking about how really only an indie studio could pull off some of the the stuff that Valheim did that like maybe you want to jump off of because I think that trust in the player and and letting them explore like then you start to have the risk of well we don't know if the player might get frustrated or bounce off something and then they might quit whereas if you have a very scripted experience you know you feel like you have more control over keeping them in the game somehow I don't know do you have anything to say about that yeah, yeah, I think this is a good question for the group, too. I'd like, like to hear your point of view, because it is interesting that you keep seeing 
seen it again and again. There's so many games that are having a huge impact on players that uh, resonate with them that are come from indie studios. They don't really come from these bigger studios, right? And I kind of wonder why that is. Like, I think part of the reason is just that, you know, these are kind of more narrow sort of games maybe that, uh, that the big shots at the studio feel like aren't worth the investment or maybe it's it's just different motivations that the studio has on, on how they want to green light games um but um yeah i think it's just really kind of fascinating and we're in this sort of kind of like era now where we're you know people are investing in kind of the the future that they believe in and type, type of games that they want to see and we're talking about democratization of all these different things right um, and so I think it's really, really interesting. Um, actually, I'd be interested to hear what Rachel thinks because you know you are working kind of at an indie studio. What is kind of the thoughts uh, that you have or uh, your studio has? And AFK. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. No, 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 that's no problem. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. What does everybody else think about that? Um, I think that it's a safe. So here's an example. Um, if you make a pixelated, like crappy looking game, then that's going to be less attractive, right? Um, if you make a more attractive game, then you have a higher adoption rate, right? Um, and so I think that's all about making a safe bet. And so what they see are these like AAA games that keep getting bigger and bigger in scope from 500 person teams to 1500 person teams to now there's like a 2000 person team and the, and they're making, they're like cranking out. I'm, I'm not going to like throw shade because it's still like a monument of, 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 an, of an IP, but, um, and it's all about you know, safety, right? And it, it takes a bold move, which is why I think that this is like the indie space because they don't have the time or the money or the artists to, to really like lean into great graphics or immersive VO, um, and so I think that's why it's the default for AAA titles is that it's it's a safer bet than making something that's either unattractive or unappealing in some way. And if you have the money and you have the resources, you might as well do that because then if you could if you could take a game like Valheim and you could put that AAA finish on it, if you could make it as beautiful as Mirror's Edge, and if you could make it, you know, there there's sometimes the boss heads will talk to you if you could like feel those with you know, the guy that does Optimus Prime or something. Like, obviously it's going to be a more polished and, and sort of feeling like it's a more intentional experience. Um, and so it it absolutely doesn't make any sense for a, a AAA studio to not take advantage of the resources that they have. I also think a lot of it is just um, where, does the, where does it start? Um, a lot of AAA studios start from a uh, monetization or sort of you know, profit margin like standpoint, and then they try to build a game around that, or they start from an asset standpoint. Well, we have this many artists that can create this much art so we can, you know, s slap some design on it. But a lot of the indie studios are, are starting from design first. And I think that's why, and everything serves that core, you know, beginning. And that's why um, a lot of the best design games are coming out of the indie studios. Yeah, it just feels a little maddening, though, you know, as a you know, creative developer, and, you know, we're all creative developers mm -hmm. here, it's just like, you know, I feel like there's no shortage of ideas or, or you know, really design-oriented, driven sort of ideas at, at the big studios. It's just challenging to get these games greenlit and mm -hmm. um, kind of started within the studio just because, you know, like you said, Kevin, it's just a lot of it is like, you know, there's a lot of... Um, gatekeeping of just well you know what is how you know what is the you know how are we going to be able to 10x this idea you know? right and um <laughs> which was funny because i was talking with someone in bizdev with uh valheim and they were like well i don't think they're, i think they're going to churn out by may i don't think they're going to be able to grow massively i'm like well <laughs> that probably really wasn't their motivation to do mm -hmm. that you know? right um, yeah and the uh the other thing is just um uh, you know, like how many, like how many people are creating assets and code and all the other things that 
and and just management like you know, on those 1500 person teams right how much uh, is that of the personnel or just logistics right at that point um versus like how many designers you know fewer and fewer designers seem to be like just doing that you know like most most uh studios even ones that are starting up are, are first thinking about well who's gonna who's gonna draw everything you know who's gonna animate everything who's gonna code everything um and they're not thinking about well, who's gonna think up they need one guy to think up the big idea but they don't think about like how many you know lower level designers they're going to need to do all the little details that support that original vision so i feel like there's a real imbalance as well of like asset creators versus just pure game designers and so and it, it's kind of showing you know like we've seen a lot of really beautiful games that are um pretty shallow when it comes to game design and not very inspired over the last few years or several years and i think that's a spectrum too like you're totally right um and it just again it just depends on who your audience is like a movie you know like if you make a B-roll horror film, mm -hmm. you're not going to try to tell an amazing story like Memento or something like that. It's the same with video games. Um, if you if you just want to give someone like a, like you are an active participant in this, mm -hmm. this war story that we're telling, or you're an active participant in, who cares, like you're killing Nazis, it's Wolfenstein or something, um, then, like, then that's, that's fine. Like, not, not every game has to be super deep and complex and hard and, mm -hmm. and um, but yeah, I think that's why the, I think you're totally right. That's why the indie space is emerging so much is because people come up with a premise for a game and then they build everything else around that simple premise, like untitled goose game. Like you're just going to be a goose and you're going to mm -hmm. fucking cause trouble. Right. And it was wholesome and it was fun and it was well designed and it was to the per point of its, of its purpose. And, yeah. And, and for every Valheim and untitled goose, there's tons of them that are failures, right? <laughs> like that don't quite make you know, make it. But, uh, I love that, that it's design is actually going on, but yeah, it's, it's hard for companies to like back every idea. So they want to go for the sure thing. And, you know, the business side of it rears its ugly head, but here we are. This is maybe a, like a kind of loaded line of conversation given uh, the people up on stage, but I'll just throw out that like <laughs> grabbing Grabbing little ideas like this and polishing them into those fully arted experiences that require 1500 person teams kind of has been Blizzard's game for the long mm -hmm. time. Like yeah. that's sort of what they've, what they've been up to. Um, and so I'll be curious to see if, if that's like still something that they, they end up doing going forwards. Yeah. It, Cause the model, I feel like things just move so quickly now that you don't have a genre that just sits out there you know, diamond in the rough style waiting to be picked up and polished for, you know, two, three years at a time, right. maybe even more. It just seems, it seems like it's accelerated so much. Mm -hmm. Did any of you guys play Genshin Impact? I didn't really, but I just feel like the success of that game last year is kind of like a really strong counterexample to everything we've been talking about. And which, like, what I'm saying is my impression of that game, given how much everybody was just decrying, oh, it stole this and Breath of the Wild, it's just got mm -hmm. these kind of these shameless, you know, gotcha game mechanics and stuff in there. That feels to me like, you know, Chris, is it you who always tells the anecdote about House of Cards and how they basically created it, like, algorithmically? It was Netflix <laughs> seeing that pe mm -hmm. people loved Kevin Spacey and they loved political drama, <clears throat> they loved whatever, and so they're like, why don't we just make a thing that <laughs> has these attributes right. and ship it? Um, and Genshin feels like that, and then it, it kind of killed last year. Um, and so, I mean, I think that model still works, and I, I, I wonder, I wonder if a more, a more polished Valheim that, that takes some of this stuff up to heart kind of emerges, or would it feel false for being sort of more, more polished up? Like, I, maybe the rawness is kind of what I want. I don't, I don't see a AAA studio just taking a leap of faith like the way Valheim does in mm -hmm. terms of just being like, you're out here, you know, figure it out. Yeah, I don't think um, AAA studios would really understand why Valheim is good. So in their attempt to copy it. They would artify the heck out of it. They'd fix all the bugs, you know, with lots of code. But uh, they'd, they'd miss the magic and the reason why it's so good. And so or then, or well, they just had their own idea of what the magic was. Like, if you ever yeah. played Grounded by EA, like, it was just a wholesome, fun, survival game where 
sometimes you would fight an ant and it's the size of a dragon and it was really wholesome like in the same vein of uh, Animal Crossing. I, I, I have, I mean, there are games that are coming out that are trying to be the AAA, you know, Rust or the AAA Valheim. Mm-hmm. And, and, and again, it just matters what your, what your premise is, and what your, your goal kind of is. Um, and I think that Grounded actually did a really good job. And I, I, I think the only reason that people churned off of it was just, uh, they wanted more, which is always a good problem to have, yeah. you know? Have any of you, like, felt like, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think it's, you know, it was interesting because I was playing at Grounded a lot with a friend of mine, and, um, and then I heard about Valheim, and I'm like, why is Valheim getting so much attention when, you know, we already have Grounded, and Grounded's made by Obsidian, it's made by, a, you know, kind of a AAA studio, and um, I think the main differences between the two games, I, I, th- I agree with you, Candace, I think it has a lot of, uh, it has a lot of, charm to it and it's 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 a, it's a really immersive sort of game and i love the story and the hit you know the sh- honey i shrunk the kids sort of vibe but i think you know the differences between valheim and that game is like um is, is valheim is just so much more just like simple and open as open interpretation to players kind of the things we were talking about earlier just about you know and grounded they have a very set narrative and you're discovering bits of the story and it has a storyline right and um, I think that kind of narrows the scope of the game in some ways. Um, but uh, yeah, I do definitely think it. I, you know, it has to be a discussion among all bigger studios. They're all looking at Valheim right now, going, you know, how can we kind of encapsulate this and grow, grow it, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's always going to be a challenge because, you know, this is also a challenge with WoW, right? Where it's like, it's a PVE game. Um, it's also a challenge with Genshin that you were talking about, Luca, right? It's just that you got to keep adding content. So you have to have this big live ops team to build out all this stuff. And the players kind of go through it very quickly. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, you know, it just becomes very expensive and kind of hard to maintain. Um, of course, you know, Valheim has like a creative sort of mode and it's like up to the players to do things. I really think the next step for Valheim of how they grow is really just give more creator um, tools and let players mod it out. Like if you look at Skyrim, players are still playing Skyrim. It's still one of the most watched like games on YouTube, and it's all just mods, right? Oh, I didn't think about that. Man, I want to spend a. S- oh, I'm sorry. I just the idea of finishing Valheim. Like I've not played a game in a while that I felt so content to just sip. You know, I don't mm-hmm. feel like I need to really rush with it. And I, I, I wanted to ask you all earlier, like, have any of you felt like you've kind of finished Valheim in terms of, well, I, I see the edge of the world and there's a big sign that says early access and come back later for, you know, mining mithril or whatever. Uh, and, and like, if you have, kind of what does that feel like? But like, for me, it's feel, I feel like I know that there are some tiers of ore beyond where I am now, but I just don't feel pressured to get to them. I'll be happy to get to them. Like, I, I intend to get to them but I'm not like, oh man, if I if I get to silver tonight, like that's gonna that's gonna fix everything and make this game so much better. Like I know it'll be more of the same on the way up, and I'm I'm kind of totally fine with it. I, I guess how are you all pacing yourselves playing it? Like how does it feel to you know burn out on Valheim if anyone has, or what do you do past you know 60 hours? Like are you treating it differently? I mean, I guess I can speak to that because I've played like 120 hours in the last two weeks. Also, by the way, I'm currently unemployed, so <laughs> I, between jobs. Right now, Unrelatedly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't start it right until the 29th. Um, and so, and again, because I have that role where I like to, I like to provide for my friends. Um, I've actually hit that wall now, where I do want to see the. We've killed three out of the five bosses. I've heard that there will be up to eight bosses eventually when the game actually releases. Um, but I feel like I don't know. I, Getting the new ore just feels like going through the motions, and it kind of, I feel like I've explored as much of the world as I'm going to see because I've found all the biomes. Like, I know there's a winter biome that I'm not ready for yet, and I know there's a plains biome that I'm not ready for yet. So, like, I see it, and I think that's the problem, is I kind of saw the end, and now Mm -hmm. I'm just like, why do I 
the same thing happened to me with Breath of the Wild, to be honest. Like, I never killed Ganon because I knew that once I killed Ganon, I would never, I would never do shrines. And what I actually liked doing was finding shrines and doing shrines. Um, so yeah, I feel like I am at my point of burnout where I still want to provide for my friends. I don't feel that the need to be on all day to do that anymore. Um, and um, I feel like I could quit actually today and feel just as good as if I quit after I killed all five bosses. Yes. Would you want to come back in a couple of years? No, and, and, and that's that's the, that's kind of like the weird point where um, I wanted to mention this earlier, but I think it's also I am not a business-oriented person at all. I'm very much a creative. Um, but to me, I feel like a lot of a lot of studios and a lot of what y'all were talking about was like games as a service, right? Like, how are you going to add to this? How are you going to multiply this? Whereas I feel like Valheim, and this is just my opinion, obviously, but it would also be okay to me if I were to have shipped Valheim to say, this is my saturation point. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to get more than I have now. And maybe I should just sunset this and just say, you know, this is, this is the game. Thanks for playing. Yep. And maybe you'll look forward to the next title that I, that I bring. That's but right. not continuing that game as a service. Yeah, li leaving happy and planning for yeah people departing is, is totally fine. It is definitely interesting on the psychology though, and um, of like you knowing that the content is coming to an end and the dread you kind of feel <laughs> in a way, like oh no, it's running out. Shouldn't I just stop now before I get to that point? <laughs> like before I'm finally actually done. Um, so yeah, you know, and, and Chris talks about this too, the the race to stay ahead of people's ability to consume content by all the studios. Um, but uh, I think it's okay. I think it's okay for a game to have an end. I think especially if it's a really, really good, high quality experience, you know. Um, I definitely think there are places they can take Valheim, but it's also okay that they don't, you know, try to turn it into another Rust or another game that's just like, seasonal or you know there's leagues and all this other stuff like making it into an esport or you know whatever it is like they could go a lot of different directions but it's perfectly fine just being what it is and being a really good example of that tips you still there i am still here what was can you talk about this valheim tournament like what does that entail um essentially it was a last man standing format where we invited uh, eight different you know, content creators slash community members and they had two hours to farm as much materials and make whatever weapons they could um, essentially two hours are just complete save zone and then after the two hours uh, they could continue but it was a free for all at that point so if you ran into anybody in the world you could kill them and every time you killed somebody you got you know X amount of gifted subs uh, whatever it was <laughs> And, you know, we just <laughs> went to the very end until the last man was standing, and that was the end of the tournament. It's interesting, because you turned it into a battle royale. It, you turned it into the hunt, yeah. basically. I, I love that. Exactly. Um, to be fair, the, the reason why we did it that way was less so... Um, the whole point of the tournament was less so, you know, we, we really want to turn Val Valheim into an eSport, and it was more so kind of us testing our own you know internal workflows when it comes to spinning up events um so valheim just happened to be a game that a lot of us were enjoying and we wanted to see you know how quickly could we spin up spin up any kind of you know tournament any kind of game let's use valheim and so what do we do how, how do we structure it you know how's this going to work um but we did enjoy it and i think overall it just it just so happened that the format was pretty cool and fun to watch that's dope i, I feel yeah, like yeah. valheim the, the negative space, as we keep talking about within Valheim, it, it like really enables you know people to step in and be like, well, I'm going to create this extra layer of kind of mm -hmm. you know meta game within it like that. Honestly, yeah, that that sounds like so much fun. That sort of um, the again the player experience is what they bring to the game. Like it obviously, it was a huge you know part of vanilla that everybody always talks about. It was very intentional, but like. Uh, I am always just like so impressed, you know, when I would tune into Asmund Gold to see the types of challenges he was creating within what felt like such a rigid, existing, story-driven, you know, theme park game like Modern WoW, and like all the transmod competitions and everything like that. Like that user-generated content, mm -hmm. I, I think comes more easily in Valheim. But yeah, I think you're right. 
Yeah. That wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> I just had to gush. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, so... I think how, when it comes to sandbox games, one of the biggest criticisms, I can only speak from the player's side, is that you know often they're touted as these you know endless adventures and you can be who you want to be and do what you want to do. But sometimes, and again, this is just from the player's side, it feels like that's touted as kind of um, an excuse for just not having very much content. Um, mm-hmm. Or maybe that just the vision of an endless experience on the developer's side is very different than what it is on the player's side. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's it's been it's been interesting to see, like for, with Valheim, for example, you do have a lot of leeway, leeway to do a lot of really cool things. And sometimes, like, you're put in a sandbox in these games, and it is literally a sandbox, but you're not given a shovel, you're not given a bucket, you're not right. really given any tools to, like, realize the full potential of that sandbox. Yeah, and then um, the other thing I just about the sandbox thing is it still has to be designed. You know, like, you're still trying to design the ability for players to find great experiences. Because if you just dump people in into a sandbox... And like you're saying, don't give them any toys, then they're not going to make their own fun. A lot of times they're going to wait for you to give them something to have fun with. So you still have to design a sandbox game. Uh, but a lot of companies or a lot of games might not see that, you know, like you're saying, it's an excuse just to like, oh, the players will figure it out. You know, we'll just give them assets. But you still have to put some game design into it. Oh, yeah, okay. Kevin, what is your thoughts on this? Because, uh, you know, I think a big trend now in games and MMOs and virtual worlds going forward, this is something Candace is going to have to maybe think about, it's just like this concept of the metaverse, which mm-hmm. is like user-generated content and basically players have more agency over the game. It's like kind of creating, like, you know, they can basically take some of their... And Valheim kind of does this in sort of a way where you have your character and there's all these servers and when you go to them you keep all your stuff right? mm-hmm. like, or well it's whatever is on your character right yeah but um yeah i think that's another really interesting part about Valheim. i think it's something that you know uh, maybe we'll see more of in the future is basically you just take your character and go to a different server in that game in that world and carry things with you yeah um so one of the things that you know i believed from very early on is that if you rely on the player base to create your content most of your content is going to be garbage <laughs> right um yeah like th- there's a reason that like i mean talent is just rare you know and that's why you know and most companies hire the best talent that they they can well that's available you know and their resources etc but um you know for every guy you know who's knocking out masterpieces you know there's guys like me that are like drawn stick figures right so um that's just the way the world works so you and this is where game design again comes in it's like you have to create an environment that facilitates people creating great art like you have to still do the work to get to meet them halfway to get them to create by giving them structure and to give them direction and you know, some people are just are just geniuses and they'll take whatever you give them, they'll run with it. You know, like the guy that, you know, made the Millennium Falcon in, in Valheim, right? I don't know if you guys saw that or not, but... What? Yeah, so somebody did that and it's just like, yeah, okay, there's people like that that are going to do that. And uh, the thing was massive and it, it was amazing, right? But most of the time people are just going to draw a penis, you know, and that's it. That's the extent <laughs> of what they can think of, right? Um <laughs> And so it's like, okay, well, if you want, you know, 0.1% of your world being a masterpiece like the Millennium Falcon and the rest just penises, and that's all you aspire to, then great. Just let the community build what they want, you know, but otherwise you're going to have to design and meet them halfway. That actually reminds me of um, when I played Neverwinter, I think, Neverwinter yeah. Online. Neverwinter, um, yeah. Or a, they had yeah. a, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if I got that wrong, I, I, but they, they did this thing where players could make dungeons. Mm-hmm. And there were, like, top of the dungeons. Yeah. It was, like, the most badass thing I'd ever heard of. Yeah. And I was and I played one that was, like, this narrative experience. And I was like, yes, girl, like, I'm feeling this. This mm-hmm. is so fucking cool. And then, and, but the top rated one was literally, it was literally <laughs> because they found out the rules of, like, yes. you can only make a dungeon this big. And here's how far apart mm-hmm. the, the monsters that drop loot have to be. Yes. The most popular dungeon for two months 
running what's called 50 ogres in a row. Right. And it was literally just like a hallway, a room, an mm-hmm. ogre, a hallway, a room, yep. an ogre. And it was all about times. XP or reward rate. It, you yes, because you got the most XP and the yeah. most rewards from it. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> nothing to do with an artistic <laughs> that's, experience. That's yeah. the penis. That's, right. that's the penis. And right below that was just a bunch of god-awful mess, right? <laughs> like, there was, like, yeah, a, an amazing right, artistic right. experience, the ogre hallway, and then a whole lot of garbage, right? Of people trying. It's not like they're not trying, but most of the time people just, you know, there's a very small percentage of people that can actually be amazing content creators. Yeah, I think you're so right with this, Kevin. It's just, you know, it's something humbling to think about because whenever you look at, like, all these games that have creator modes and stuff like that, what are the things players always create? They always recreate things uh, that are already created by a professional. Mm-hmm. Like they will right. make Disney Man or the Millennium yep, Falcon. That's right. Or they'll make that, a Game of Thrones area, right? Like mm-hmm. They're influenced, they're kind of recreating these things. It's so hard to create something out of yep. nothing. Talent is know, super rare. Make something new. And so, yeah, you know, yeah, so, so I find that really, really interesting. And I think that's a challenge with the metaverse, mm-hmm. which, like, all this relying on UGC and things like Roblox and stuff like that. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting with Roblox because if you ever played it, and, you know, I spent a couple hours trying it out, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the, the games in there are just like, you know, I'm sorry, but they're not very good. Yeah. They're made by kids, right? Right. Kids don't know any better and things like that. But then if you look at, like, Roblox's concurrency and the players who play it, mm-hmm. it kind of, after, like, a certain age, it just drops off a cliff. Right. You know, they just do not come back. And I think it's because novelty of being online with your friends at school and things like that making your own games is great but after a while they have a you know, they get a bigger taste for something mm-hmm. you know a little more substantial yeah and a lot of the uh, game modes in roblox are also just copies of other successful games like they have an among us in there they've got a battle royales in there they've got you know prison escape <laughs> modes you know <laughs> like it's just a bunch of um you know, like, again, look, you're saying it's already been made by someone else and now it's being recreated here. So, uh, and it's a similar problem with this idea that we're going to be, um, you know, at some point in the future, we're going to be surrounded by really good programmatically generated content, you know, <laughs> like, um, and that's not coming anytime soon because it's like, yeah, programmatically generated can be made really fast, but the quality level is going to be all over the place and you still need a human being to parse through, you know, all of the generated content and say, okay, well, this is actually good and this is actually bad. Um, and so both, both styles of, of trying to approach success through either programmatically generated or user generated content, I think are, um, real long shots. It's such a gamble, dude. Like, I I worked um, on a game many years ago called Project Spark. That was my first game in the industry. Microsoft mm-hmm. put it out. And uh, this was before they bought Minecraft, at which point it sort of felt like, why were you building this in the first place? But mm-hmm. um, the game was, it was like a, it was a creator game. It was a tool set, world gen and stuff. And what separated it was that you could, uh, like a fork off this old game called Kodu or something like that. K-O-D-U. Mm-hmm. There was like a a rough visual coding language in the game and you could put basically like these these behavioral patterns or brains onto literally any object in the world that you wanted and it looked kind of like a rebus basically it was you know when icon do icon very simple Mm -hmm. but and it was like it was this super powerful tool set like you could you could make the wildest shit that you wanted to in there because you could be like i want to i'm gonna make a projectile gun that when my character equips it and it's going to shoot out goblins and then I'm going to run a bunch of math <laughs> functions to make these goblins increase in size and mm-hmm. they have collision and do like you could you could bend the rules and break the game so easily but most of the UGC that you would see again mirrored mm-hmm. stuff that was kind of already out there yeah and we also shipped like an on rails kind of narrative with it that um well, I just never really felt like was the, it's not really the right way to try to get somebody into a UGC games to give them like a, a linear story to just kind of right. romp through. It was yeah, weird yeah. onboarding, and and I, I feel like the the problem with those UGC games is that it's this like siren song of oh we'll just make the platform and then you know <laughs> the kids are just going to make all our content for us right. and it's like yeah but if you don't get a, everything about that world exactly right and make mm-hmm. the tools feel fun and make it pleasant to be in no one's gonna build shit in your game yeah. because they just don't want to be there that's right um, yeah 
That game's offline yeah. now. Rip. It was a good time though. <laughs> you can you can get some good stuff out of UGC, right? Like I oh, mean, for sure. many games have, have come out of editors like you know Dota from from Warcraft Three or uh, you know Counter Strike from what Half Life or whatever. But I think the key is that it needs to come out of an established game that has a big player base that has you know game, good gameplay to work off of, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, no one created Dota out of just Game Maker Pro. It came out of, right, Warcraft 3. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that is a challenge with Roblox, with Manticore, and all these other solutions. Is just that it's just going to be hard for the player to reference something. In that It's harder to, look, to create something on a blank canvas than it is, you know, using existing blocks, right? Yeah. And also, you know, the I think the real trick is just... Um, you know, if they're going to try this model where use generated content is, you know, the the lion's share of what's made, they have to find better ways of getting the cream to get to the top, you know, like advertising the amazing work that's actually being done. Because there will always be, like what, Minecraft is a great example, like for every just terrible thing that's made in Minecraft, you know, there's tons of it, but there's also some amazing stuff in Minecraft, right? So advertising or getting people to see the things that are amazing and being able to participate in those experiences um i think should be one of the things that um companies that are trying to rely on ugc look to making more visible right so and you were talking about never about never winner candace and it's like yeah that they had the vote up system right but the vote up systems are always really sketchy because they're you know community controlled and people are going to upvote random things you know especially in the age of like twitch or um you know influencers right it's like if asmongold gives his thumbs up on a map on minecraft right it's like okay well suddenly there's 50,000 more you know likes on that thing for no other reason than he said go do it yeah it's interesting because steam steam ran into that problem too and they had a really interesting solution where people can now tag the games and so the most popular tags come to the top so you could say mm-hmm. like tag great design or tag i love asthma gold <laughs> right right and you can see why yeah. people are voting favorably for yeah and if games. i read reviews on steam a lot and so many of them are value analysis right like not worth it you know <laughs> like thumbs down or worth it thumbs up right they don't comment about the art or the game design or how satisfying experience they had it's just how can they charge ten dollars for this DLC, right? Like, um, which is a totally different thing. To, is this game good? Will I enjoy it? You know, like, um, so it's yeah. Again, it's community controlled, um, you know, popularity, which has just a really unpredictable metric for determining what's good. Just a reminder too that Valheim is only twenty bucks. Like. Whoever was mm-hmm. the one that settled on that as the sweet spot number, <laughs> I, I think that is just such a pivotal thing. Like, yeah, that's yeah. just enough that you're like, this isn't going to be shovelware. Right. But if my friends stop playing it after this weekend, I'm not going to be that mad about it. Mm-hmm. And it also makes it easy for you to go, well, if they never added anything more to this, I've already pl- spent two weekends playing my friends. You yeah. know, it's 20 bucks. I that's played right. it for like 20 hours. Like, I'm good. Yep. But how many people yeah, are like, oh, you know right. what we could do? We could make our own Valheim and then charge 60 bucks for it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, it's just like, a AAA oh. studio throwing something out there for $20. <laughs> right. You know, it's... You got to pay for all the commercials, right? On the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, I mean, this has been really awesome. I think, you know, we're a little over a half an hour. It's a really great conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to be mindful of everybody's time. And um, oh. Uh, oh, sorry, I just brought someone new up. Sure, yeah, wanna... hey. Well, hey, let's have hey. one more question. Oh, not now. Well, yeah. So, sorry, I jumped in, in late. Um, can you guys hear me okay? What's up, Nana? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so, one of the things I really found really great about Valheim is that the design was like laser focused right mm-hmm. it was, they're, they're going to be about building and you can be as creative as you can be within the, the rules that they set and there's going to be some RPG there's bosses and then like progression system with that um, and they're able to, to create this big world with these two rule sets at a very small like gigabyte level right mm-hmm. and so one of the questions is why do 
AAA studios really struggle with like scope creep to the point where it takes years and years to develop um, and they can't seem to have a design as laser focused as what Valheim put out. Right. I, and I think this uh, comes back to one of the points I made earlier. Um, and that's one of the, 100% it's one of the things I love about Valheim. Um, everything in that game has a really distinct purpose. There's no waste. There's no fat on that game at all, right? Um, but I think a lot of AAA studios have tons of asset creators and not enough game designers, right? So uh, just go make assets is sometimes the plan. We don't know exactly where this game is going yet, but we know we're going to need assets, right? So they end up making 100 assets, but they only really have a, f a good, well-designed function for, say, 50 of them, right? And it's like, well, what do we do with the rest of the assets? Well, it's just more assets. It's good, right? So you throw them in, but they start to feel, it feels like waste. It feels like, you know, a bunch of extra clutter or, yeah. you know, whatever it is. So um, rather than it's we're the putting this in. Of doors in cyberpunk you can't open, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's one of the big problems is just, it's not. It doesn't necessarily start from a design standpoint. Like, and that's what why Valheim has been so impressive to me. Is just, it's just so design focused. You know, they come up with exactly what they need to fill a specific spot or spot in the game, has a very specific purpose, and then they add it. And that's it. And that's all they have time for, right? That's all they have the resources for, right? They're doing the bare minimum, kind of because they have to in a lot of ways. They don't have that problem anymore because they've been so successful. So we'll see what they do now. But um, a lot of other companies don't uh, either for either consciously or um, unconsciously or, or, or just putting in too much waste in their in their games. Yeah, I mean, like oh, the other thing, too, is like great creativity comes from constraints, right? And so I think being able to have less people, it just keeps you focused. And I think focus is so important. And I think when you have more people on a team and more things, you have more mm -hmm. sort of like cooks in the kitchen, essentially. And it's very easy for it to just balloon out and get, you know, like you said, just kind of get, uh, you know, so complicated and, um, you know, off the rails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to add to that. I think that a part of it is just the human problem where communication is hard and vision alignment is hard and the fewer voices you have in the room the more controlled your vision is not to say your vision is better but it's mm -hmm. it's under control right but when you have and i'm going to pick on this game even though i think it's a fucking masterpiece of a game <laughs> um but when you have a, a game like red dead redemption where you have people who are in charge of this and you have people that are in charge of that someone is going to make it their their white whale to make sure that the horse testicles shrink when it's cold you know like they have the bandwidth and the time and that's the level of fidelity that they care about whereas like i feel like that that kind of thinking only comes from whenever you you, you kind of you know there's there's too that many wasn't people part of the master vision of the game right. you know that was just something that that serendipitously happened is a great player story and yeah. it's amazing but also and some of those ads are amazing and some of those ads are yeah. pointless, right? So there's also the full breadth of possibilities there. But yeah, at the end of the day, none of those served, you know, the, the core vision of the game, right? I mean, I, I think I've not really played Red Dead 2. I played a lot of the first one, but I don't want to say it's an unfortunate example, but that is a game that actually got out the door and won accolades for like all of the polish that it did have. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that Shrinking Horse Nuts, you know, made it, <laughs> but... In playing Cyberpunk, all of the complaints that I would see were people relating it to how, well, oh, in Red Dead, you know, 2, the, the fourth wall never breaks. There's no problems with any of that at all. They covered everything. And, like, the, the truth is, though, that, you know, 95% of the studios that ever attempt to polish something like that mm -hmm. will just sink under their own, you know, they'll right. run out of money. Right. Um, Rockstar can afford to do that, and they can afford to take 10 years because... They have a money printing machine in the basement called GTA Online that they can't turn off, so mm -hmm. they can do whatever they want. But even then, though, uh, you know, just just to soften that a little bit, I feel like uh, as as Chris said, you know, real great imagination and and design comes from constraints, and there are there are plenty of stories of you know companies with infinite money machines on that manage to not really pull it together too, because that that mm -hmm. freedom can can be 
kind of a prison in its own its own right. You know, you feel like there's no option you shouldn't explore because you're probably able to pay for it. And then Cries what's not limited in those scenarios, even if money seems like it is, is morale and attention span. And then people get tired of it's eight years and I haven't shipped a game. You know, mm-hmm. so there is another resource that you could exhaust even in that in that spot. Yeah, for sure. Also, just the right, general like, answer my question. Just the uh, general uh, accountability. Uh, I have other thoughts. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, that, yeah, that's uh, all I was going to say. Yeah, but go, Chris. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say as well, like, you know, I just want to throw this in there, too, just because I just thought about it. But, you know, one thing I love about Valheim, too, with its simplicity is, you know, the kind of crypts, the dungeons, right? Yeah, they're it's like, rudimentary. It, it feels like a dungeon, right? It feels like a core fantasy dungeon. I feel like, you know, in MMOs, even WoW, I feel like in you know, I love the dungeons as well, right, for what they are. But I think they've kind of drifted from what the ultimate, like kind of the, the original fantasy of the dungeons were, which is like mm-hmm. this kind of tight, like, you know, space that oh, is right, like, right. Uh, you know, um, dangerous and dark and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but so, it, at the I same mean, time, they're yeah. very rudimentary, right? Like the map, the layouts are really simple and, uh, you know, like... <laughs> I, I get lost in them. They, right, but they again. It's just the, the, to the point where it's like they've done so much with so little, and it's because of the execution, right? Like, it's still a very satisfying experience to go into a dungeon and clear it out, you know. And again, the feel of it, and the sound, and the lack of light, and you know, a little bit of combat, a little bit of looting, and uh, but yeah, when you think about it from like that triple a standpoint it's like really this is your dungeon <laughs> right like where are the vistas where are the you know like the big explosions the giant cold cauldron of molten metal being poured into you know it's just like right. they don't need they didn't need all that you know certainly it would be better in some cases with that but yeah the it's super simple but super well well executed uh, i think for for me it kind of hit some of the it's like when i talk about core rpg stuff it's like I, I feel a real sense of progression, and then as I get stronger, I go back to the places where I used to struggle in, and I just destroy them now because mm-hmm. I'm smarter, but I'm also stronger, my gear is better, and I progress farther in the game, yeah. and there's a real level of satisfaction in that. Mm-hmm. But even with like the dungeons, right, they are super simple, they're easy to navigate, but you still have to start learning how to deal with like the different... Yeah. You know hurdles that they throw at you, but it, it did kind of remind me. Like I'm a classic WoW guy, but like it did remind me of my, my first trips to like Deadlines. I'm actually going into this dungeon, or a better example is probably Wailing Caverns, which really just feels like this kind of dungeon place that exists in the world, and I'm going to go adventure to that place mm-hmm. and find what's in there. Yeah. Um, and it really hit that that note for me really well. Yeah, absolutely, and. Uh... Gosh, this is kind of a long comment, but one I wanted to illustrate about uh, Valheim sending a really strong message. Um, something I talk about on my stream. In fact, I just had a huge rant about it. But um, we're constantly being told um, that the gaming community has changed over the years. Now we know everything much quicker and everybody's min-maxing everything. And Valheim's success is such a strong message that this is not true, that that there's still a huge audience for people that just want to jump in, not be spoiled, explore the world, um, learn as we go. Um, because if, if it were true, you know, what people say all the time, um, then people would have just watched a couple videos on how to speed run Valheim, you know, a week after it came out and been bored with it almost instantly, right? But Valheim was super popular and that's because it was such a wonderful thing to explore, such a wonderful thing to grow and learn in and a new experience. And it was just really satisfying. So um, I think people should take notice that we're, we're still hungry for these types of games and this idea that it can't be done because, because Twitch exists or YouTube exists or the gaming community is min-maxing everything and spoiling everything way too fast is just not true. Yeah, I think it's kind of what Candace was saying earlier about, like, you know, Breath of the Wild being, like, you know, she didn't want to kill Ganon or whatever because it would end the game. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I think Valheim does a really good job of making it about the journey rather than the destination. Yeah. You know? um, and that's usually what kind of games adjacent to kind of Valheim or in, in that area kind of 
can go wrong is where it becomes about getting to the end and um, you're you're right that I feel like it's all about kind of exploring and pacing yourself and uh, and the immersion there yeah um, well, that was really awesome guys yeah very much loved it yeah yeah so, uh, so yeah great question Anna you triggered us to add another 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> Um, You're but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, thanks for everybody for joining, and um, this has been really great and awesome. A great test bed here. You know, Clubhouse is still kind of really closed off. It's invite only still, and iOS only, and all that. But uh, this is something that I think could have a lot of potential and uh, really fun conversation to add and meet new people and things like this. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, we'll, we'll do it again. And uh, uh, yeah. Thanks very much for putting it together. Add. And for the invite. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, everyone have a good night. Nice thanks. All right, Cheers. thank you. Take care. Bye. Good night, guys. See you. Thanks again. See ya. See ya. All right, thanks for watching. That was Clubhouse Chat with uh, various devs and some people come jumping up from the um, from the uh, <laughs> from the chat. Um, I didn't realize it was invite only, so. Naturally, the people that all ask questions, you probably recognize Nano Nano uh, Tips. And uh, Rachel, you, you guys probably don't know, but uh, she's a veteran game developer as well, artist. Um, anyway, thanks for watching very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to sign off um, my failure to analyze video here. But uh, yeah, just just you don't have to smash the like button. Just gently, just gently brush past it if you like the video. Anyway, I'll see you next time, guys. Thanks very much.